Father and venerable religious, dear parishioners, the Mass today is offered in vestments the color of blood. For we are honoring the most precious blood of Jesus today on this feast of, of, for July 1st. We know how important blood is. It circulates throughout the body, giving oxygen and other nutrients not only to the major organs, the brain, the lungs, even the the heart has to nourish itself, the all the other internal organs, but also the the blood goes to the tiniest parts of the human body, the the tips of the fingers, the capillaries, they I believe they're called where the 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 blood brings the oxygen and nutrients and it carries away waste. And then those are taken to the kidneys. And so it's, it's just a wonderful system that God has made. And we talk about, well, we know how important blood is, so we call it life-giving blood. Many of you have given blood, your blood donors. Without blood, the body dies. It has to be healthy blood. It has to be able to fulfill its function. And so that's the physical aspect of blood. The, one of the most crucial components of life. But it goes beyond that. There's also a symbolic value. It stands for life itself. It stands for something most precious. You've heard, I'm sure, of agreements that were signed in blood. And we, we shouldn't be doing this, it's, but you read about it in history, how people sometimes to convey the, the seriousness of a contract that they were doing, they, they, they signed their name in blood. And as though I can't give anything more to express my seriousness than to, to, to uh, let this blood be on the document. We talk about people shedding their blood for their country. And if there are, is a cloth or a piece of paper or something that has the person's blood, it's treasured because that... Of who that of what that represents, who it represents. We see in the Old Testament that the people were taught by divine law to have the utmost respect for blood because it was seen as life itself. And it's interesting that although people were allowed to eat the flesh of animals, uh, except for the unclean animals such as pork, they were forbidden that, but they were never allowed to use the blood of that animal. There was a most severe prohibition. You will not eat or consume or make use of blood. So the blood had to be entirely drained out of the body of the animal before it could be uh, used for food. And even the blood could not just be poured out on the ground. It had to be covered over with dirt. It had to be you know, poured into some kind of uh, you know, little hole dug in the ground and then covered over. What was God doing? What was, and this was also reiterated in the law of Moses. What were, what were the people being taught? To have respect for life. Even though it wasn't human life, there was this idea of respecting blood. And that prohibition against blood lasted throughout 
the, the 13 centuries before Christ came. And even when the apostles had the first council of Jerusalem and passed as legislation that nobody has to observe the Mosaic law anymore. In other words, you don't have to be a good Jew to be a good Christian. They still kept the prohibition against blood. It was as a disciplinary thing. But that eventually was changed, and and that prohibition is no longer there. But again, we can see the, the, the respect that was shown to blood as the symbol of life itself. And, of course, to shed another human being's blood, to kill that person, was to induce this penalty of capital punishment. Nobody but nobody was allowed to shed the blood of another unless it was a just war or it was a matter of verified and certain uh, guilt for enormous crimes. Nobody has that authority to take on his or her, her own authority. Nobody has the authority to take somebody else's life. That belongs to God. Thou shalt not kill. So despite this, or I shouldn't say despite, but even though there is this tremendous respect for blood, or that it was in the Old Testament, and obviously still needs to continue for insofar as human blood is concerned. St. Paul says in his letter to the Hebrews something very powerful. And it's not in today's epistle, but it's a few verses later on. He says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Isn't that interesting? It seems like a contradiction. It's a paradox. Don't shed blood, respect blood, but in the Old Testament, rivers of blood flowed from all of the animal sacrifices that were commanded. So God was saying, even though you have to have this tremendous respect for for blood, you're allowed to sacrifice animals, obviously, but you can't use their blood. You certainly cannot shed the blood of another human being on your own authority, but there must be a lot of flowing of blood in the Old Testament of sacrificial animals. And so we see that huge altar outside the temple that was used for sacrifices. There were four points to it. So often those four points were anointed with the blood of an animal that had just been sacrificed. And you read you know, examples in scripture. When the temple was dedicated, for example, by Solomon, I mean, there were thousands of animals sacrificed and their blood shed in the ritual way that was prescribed. And what was God teaching the people? Well, the principle that I just said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. In other words, blood has to flow for sin to be forgiven. Keep that in mind because that is a central point in St. Paul's teaching in this chapter of Hebrews. Now, can the blood of an animal offer infinite atonement for sin? No, it can't. But still... The people had to sacrifice so many animals and make their blood flow in the ritual sacrifices of the Old Testament because even though it couldn't take away sin, it was the best thing they could do. They certainly couldn't sacrifice another human being like the pagans would. 
So God said, sacrifice your animals. Pour out their blood in ritual. And I will take it as a, an atonement for sin, even though that blood cannot do anything of itself. I don't think it's here... Um, We're saying, well, St. It, it, Paul talks about that in today's epistle, but in other words, in the Old Testament, that's all they had. And by sacrificing these animals, and again, animals had value. You could sell them for so many shekels. I mean, ask yourself right now, what's the price of a, of a, uh, of, a of cattle or sheep or goats? Could, be, could run in the hundreds of dollars, maybe even more. So when the, we, people would sacrifice this, especially in the Holocaust, all the blood would be drained out, the entire animal would be consumed. That was a real sacrifice. And God was saying, I'll take this as a penance for your sins. So when we move to the New Testament, what is going to forgive sins. We don't sacrifice animals anymore, do we? We don't have an altar for Holocaust, for burning animals and pouring out their blood according to the ceremonial. What do we do now? We now pour out the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the mass. That's what happens in every single mass. The blood of Jesus is poured out. And now this blood has infinite value. If in and of itself it forgives, it has the power of forgiveness, the power of satisfaction. This is why we need to grow in our awareness of what happens at Mass. There's two separate consecrations, one of bread, one of wine. And even though the body and blood of Christ can never be separated again after his resurrection, mystically they are separated. If you separate somebody's body and blood, that person is dead. And it will happen in this Mass. Jesus will die mystically through the two separate consecrations, one of bread, one of wine. The bread will become his most sacred body. The wine will become his most sacred blood. And St. Paul's teaching will be verified. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Thank God for the blood of Jesus, which flows. Now, our Lord did take care of it on the cross. And this is where a tremendous mistake, a heresy, an error of Protestant theology takes place. They say, we don't need the Mass because Christ did it once and for all. It's true that he did it once and for all, but by his will... He chooses to again let the blood flow, this time mystically, not physically. And why does that need to be? Because of the ongoing sins of mankind. I can see, we should all be able to see the, 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 the infinitely wise decision of God to have the, the sacrifice of Calvary mystically a renewed over and over and over again. Why? Because mankind sins over and over and over again. There is that need for continual reminding that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. 
But why does blood have to flow? Why did it have to be blood? Why did it have to be in the Old Testament, the blood of animals? Why does it now need to be the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? I think the perfect answer was given by Bishop Sheen. I was so so inspired when I heard this in one of the sermons that he gave, I'm sure, many years ago. He says, why? He answers that question, why does the blood have to flow? Because sin is in the blood. Think about it. Think how your blood is part of most sins you have ever committed or mankind that has ever committed. The sins of the flesh is not the blood involved in that. We're reminded, you know, most souls go to hell for sins of the flesh than for any reason, any other reason. And we see the proliferation of the sins of the flesh. And people say, what's the problem? And the blood of Christ is flowing over and over in every mass, atoning for the sins of the flesh. So many people are shacking up before being married today. So many people are committing the sins of adultery, the sins of solitary sin, the sins of homosexuality. They are proliferating, and now they're being glorified. Sin is being glorified. This past month, so sad to say, the month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus was Pride Month. And you know what I mean by that. I don't even want to even say all the words. If only these people knew how the blood of Jesus had to flow for their horrible sinning of of the flesh, abusing the procreative power that God allows only in marriage between husband and wife. And even then they have to do it in a way that never offends God. The sin of birth control has been institutionalized. The sins of the flesh have become institutionalized and glorified. And people, and you have to watch out for yourselves to lose the, the, you know, the more these sins proliferate, the more we just say, oh, well, that's just the way it is. But it's sin. The horrible price had to be paid for it on Calvary. Sins of desire, sins of lusting through the eyes, all of this. The blood takes part, and so the blood has to be shed. The sins of alcoholism. You know what it is when you take that drink, the alcohol alcohol goes right into the bloodstream. The sins of drug taking, and yes, I'm going to include marijuana, that's injected so often. Where? Into the blood. Sins of anger, sins of revenge. We talk about people boiling over with anger. What does that mean? Their blood is boiling. So many sins involved. Or rather, yes, so many sins involved, or the blood is involved in so many sins. So let us, let this thought stay with us. The blood of Jesus needed to be shed for my sins and the sins of the whole world. And yes, the sin is in our blood. Let us be so thankful for what God was willing to do for us. He knew where the sin lay in so many many ways. He saw it in our blood. And so the night before he died, he said, take and drink of this, for this is the chalice of my blood, of the new and eternal covenant, which shall be the mystery of faith, which shall be shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins. Let us praise and glorify this blood that flowed 
so that we would have that chance to save our souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.